Okay. Yeah. Uh, so today we are going to have Eric to talk about uh, his work on if he, if I, uh, efficient classical algorithm for simulating a uh, symmetric quantum system. Um, so recently, like people have started to explore uh, the use of symmetry of data sets, like uh, either for either using like uh, quantum or classical data set to construct quantum machine learning ansatz. And it has been shown that uh, this construction is beneficial as we could like mitigate the trainability issues by uh, restricting uh, the expressivity of the uh, ansatz while like enable us to generate as well. But today, uh, Eric will give us different perspective. Different perspective. Like basically, he will show that uh, too much symmetry might be uh, might be my my uh, like classical system might be able to simulate. Uh, classical co uh, computer might be able to simulate the quantum system if we have too much symmetry. Yeah. So yeah. I guess uh, that Eric can start and yeah, the floor is Thanks here. for the very kind introduction. That's essentially the summary of the whole talk. So, you know, if yeah. you have to leave early, that's, uh, you get a good summary. Um, thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm Eric, I'm a PhD student over at MIT. And yeah, this is a talk that recently went up on the archive a couple of months ago. Um, it's joint work with Andy Bauer, who is in uh, Jens Eisert's group in Berlin, and also Bobak, Yanni, and Seth Lloyd over at MIT. So wouldn't have been possible without all of them. All right. Um, and yeah, if you want if you want to see it on the archive, it's this upper link here. And I know this is like a QML seminar. So along the way to motivate it, I'll bring up these trainability results. So if you want to see some papers on that, that's what these bottom two links are. So, okay, um, let's get started. So yeah, as uh, Ben Yi said, really the one of the primary motivations of this work was to examine these symmetric quantum machine learning architectures and see if these same symmetries that lead to these uh, lost landscapes to be trainable, if these same symmetries actually yield classical simulation algorithms of these models. Um, so before we even get into any of our results, really, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page and talk about QNNs, quantum neural networks, and also talk about what is known about the trainability, when they're not trainable, when they're believed to be trainable, um, things like that. Then I'll move into some background on these symmetric quantum neural networks. So the fancy word for them are symmetry equivariant quantum neural networks, but yeah, things that obey uh, various symmetries and why people are interested in them, uh, have been interested in them recently. And then finally, I'll talk about our actual main results and give some very brief proof sketches and intuition as to why these systems can be classically simulatable. So, okay, uh, without further ado, let's talk about QNNs. So I'm sure everyone has seen variations of this slide across like a variety of talks, but as we all know, we're in this NISC era of quantum computing where we have these noisy intermediate scale quantum devices, and they're sort of on the verge of classical intractability. So they're, uh, you know, starting to do things that classical computers have difficulty also doing, but they're not really practical tasks. Um, so just to give quick shout outs to these images, up here on the left is a uh, Google Sycamore superconducting chip that they did random circuit sampling on. Um, up here on the upper right is IonQ's ion trap device where they can have these long range interactions um, in their systems. And then here at the bottom, uh, Misha Lukin at Harvard has these huge atom arrays where they can rearrange these neutral atoms and get to huge qubit counts. So we're really probing the limits of what we can classically simulate. Um, and of course, in the far future, when we have large error corrected devices, we have plenty of proposals for what to do with quantum computers. We can, you know, break RSA or whatever, do Grover search or HHL. Um, but these NIST devices are way too error prone and way too small to actually have any practical utility for these kinds of tasks. So sort of counterintuitively, we want to find useful algorithms for quantum computers that essentially use them as little as possible so that we can leverage using these uh, NIST devices 
maybe for some kind of practical task. So there have been a bunch of proposals for this. Probably the most famous one that you guys have all probably heard of are variational quantum algorithms. So this is just a very general statement that if you have a task that you're interested in or a problem you want to solve, that you can phrase as a, as a minimization problem. So you have some function f of theta that you want to find the, the minimum of. And you assume that it's difficult to evaluate this function classically, but also assume that it's cheap to evaluate this function on a quantum computer. So the canonical example of this is like f of theta is an energy expectation value of some molecular Hamiltonian or something. And theta parameterizes the onslaught state that you're taking energy expectation values against. Um, so quantum computer can just prepare the state and measure the energy. Pretty simple. But a classical computer, you know, assuming things are complex enough, will have trouble evaluating this function. So uh, the, you know, evaluating f of theta is easy for a quantum computer. And so what you can do is essentially perform gradient descent and optimize this loss function, essentially completely on a classical computer, and just use the quantum computer as a black box to get gradient information or loss function value information. So um, people have been doing this for 10 years now or something. Uh, the first example of this was in 2013, I think, by people in Bristol and Harvard, and they did it to find ground states of molecular Hamiltonians. So this example I mentioned earlier, they had a quantum computer measure gradients of this loss landscape, um, and then use that information on a classical computer to take the next gradient descent step and kind of bounce back and forth and optimize its loss function that way. So. It's a very general framework. Really, anything that uh, you can optimize or anything you can efficiently evaluate on a quantum computer is like a candidate for using this VQE framework or VQA framework. And when you're hearing, uh, you know, optimize difficult loss functions, and you know of neural networks and uh, everything from the classical literature there, your mind immediately kind of connects the two. So perhaps unsurprisingly, there's been research in fitting machine learning into this framework. Um, and so there are a million proposals for this. Uh, this figure is from a paper by Eddie Farhi and Hartman Nevin at Google, where they looked at parameterized quantum circuits that you, you know, have some initial state, and then you train this parameterized quantum circuit, then you take samples at the end that you then train on a uh, like traditional machine learning loss function. So just like this f of theta can be a molecular Hamiltonian energy, you could also have this f of theta be some traditional machine learning loss function and things work essentially exactly the same. So whether it's like a, an energy kind of chemistry motivation or, or machine learning motivation, it's really the same framework, but okay. Just because we can do all of this, you know, prepare some quantum neural network by parameterizing a quantum circuit, doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea. Um, you know, quantum computers are expensive. If you could do it already, whatever this model could do on a classical computer, there's really no point to using a quantum computer to do it. So when considering whether or not these QNNs are really useful, there's really two things you have to you have to weigh and there are are these things powerful like are there tasks that we could use these quantum neural networks for that classical neural networks can't perform as efficiently and also are they trainable um we kind of take for granted in normal classical machine learning uh that neural networks are essentially always trainable um barring some extreme examples but it's not necessarily true that this intuition carries over to the quantum case. So, you know, how, how do these two things weigh for quantum neural networks? So one, one bit of good news is that these QNNs are powerful, as you might expect. Um, people over at IBM looked at if you were trying to classify data, that's just some linear classification task, 
but you kind of mask it by uh, the discrete log. So you have some kind of random looking data set, but it's discrete log. You can classify classify linearly. Um, then a quantum computer can just run Shor's algorithm, take the discrete log, and then linearly classify this data. But a classical neural network uh, will just kind of see the data as being random, so it'll be difficult to classify. So, you know, these these networks are powerful, at least in this niche case where you're running into data masked by discrete log. Also, probably other cases, which we'll get into later, but you know, yes, these things do have a reason to exist. Um, but now the other question is, okay, are they trainable? Um, just like classical machine learning models are. And unfortunately there, the answer isn't so optimistic. It's, it's a no, um, at least generally. And we'll get back to what I mean by generally in a bit, but first let me just give some intuition and some background and some of these trainability results or untrainability results. Um, so when, when examining the trainability of these quantum neural networks, typically people look in two separate cases because phenomenologically they're kind of different. Um, whether the quantum neural network is deep or whether it's shallow. So first let's talk about deep QNNs. So it turns out for deep quantum neural networks, there's this phenomenon called barren plateaus that you might've heard of, where essentially if you have a deep QNN and you're training on some loss function, um, typically your function value will concentrate around the mean. So in other words, if you were to take the gradient, at most points in the loss landscape, this gradient is going to be exponentially vanishing with the system size and very difficult to measure via sampling or something. So because of this, um, these deep models aren't very conducive to training. And to, to visualize the loss landscape of these deep QNNs, the image that always comes to mind to, for me is the surface of Tatooine. So, you know, from Star Wars, it's just a barren desert, but every once in a while you have a sharp peak. And this is sort of what the lost landscape of deep QNNs looks like. Um, it's flat almost everywhere. And then right in the neighborhood of, a, of an optimum, um, it's very sharply peaked. So if you're starting in that neighborhood, optimization is very easy because you know exactly where to go. But generically, if you're in some random point out in this barren plateau, um, you're not going to get any gradient information. You're not going to know which direction to start optimizing in, and it's going to take forever to find an optimal. Okay? So uh, this is the barren plateau phenomenon, and this is what occurs a deep quantum neural networks or deep variational quantum algorithms, um, at, at least generally. And we can also look at the case for shallow quantum neural networks, which don't have these barren plateaus. And there are a bunch of results saying that shallow quantum neural networks actually have uh, good gradients. But unfortunately there, it's also not so great. Um, in a couple of papers, one with Bobak Yanni, uh, who's also on this paper I'm giving a talk on, um, we looked at the loss landscapes of shallow uh, quantum neural networks. And there, what we showed was, uh, even if you have good gradient information, essentially you have so many poor local minima that you'll get stuck in a local optimum before you find the global optimum. So this loss landscape pictured here is from a quantum convolutional neural network, which um, are great in the sense that they don't have barren plateaus, but unfortunately they have poor local minima, at least generally. So if you're trying to optimize this loss function and you want to find this point in the loss landscape over here, but you're starting out here, you'll just get stuck in one of these local minima and you're not going to find this in a reasonable amount of time. So how I uh, imagine these shallow QNN loss landscapes is that they sort of look like a typical road in Boston where they're just filled with potholes everywhere. And if you're trying to get to a specific pothole and you're driving along, you're going to have to hit every pothole along the way until you get there. So, you know, unless you're, you have some crazy non-local optimizer that will probably end up taking forever, 
you're just going to get stuck and not be able to find this global optimum efficiently. Okay. And uh, just to be slightly more quantitative than showing pictures of roads. Um, so more specifically, what we showed is that there's a phase transition in the trainability of these quantum neural network uh, loss functions. So there's this parameter that is called the degrees of freedom parameter that we define in our paper. And effectively, when you have a generic quantum neural network, this degrees of freedom parameter scales exponentially in the system size. So this m parameter is like 2 to the n. And what we show is that when you have a number of parameters in your QNN that is less than this degrees of freedom parameter m, then your model is untrainable, essentially. So this is a histogram of local minima um, as a function of energy. And when L is less than 2m, it's in the so-called underparameterized phase. So all of these local minima are really far from the global optimum. But then suddenly, when you hit a number of parameters that's equal to m, all of your minima are concentrated at the global minima. So suddenly, it's very trainable. Um, and so intuitively, this untrainability stems from the fact that this degrees of freedom parameter m is exponentially large in n. And you know, n 2 to the n is big. And so you need a number of parameters that's so large that the model is not efficiently trainable um, once you get to this size of QNN. So, oh yeah, just for comparison, uh, this is that same kind of histogram, but for quantum neural net, or sorry, classical neural networks. And there, the quality of minima just monotonically increases with the number of parameters you have. There's no phase transition or anything. So there, it's just a different scenario. Um, right. So yeah, it's you know been 22 minutes or whatever for this talk. Obviously, there's more to the story. So um, really, even though these models are generally untrainable, there's still some hope because this generally is doing a lot of the heavy lifting here. All of these results I mentioned on untrainability, look at you know very generic uh, random quantum onsatses or whatever, random quantum neural networks that might not be typical um, when you're looking at specific problems or when you restrict your class of models in some way. So uh, that's what brings us to symm symmetry, symmetric quantum neural networks which don't satisfy this generic property. And so these bad trainability results don't apply and why people have been interested in these things. Um, are there any questions so far on why we're interested in restricted QNNs? Um, so far, I didn't see any question from the audience, but okay. uh, actually you summarize it like very, very well on like what is happening here in the field. Yeah. Oh, thanks. So yeah. So yeah, as in, like, I keep the like keep seeing like the trainability is a, a big group block um, mm -hmm. for Q and N, and then uh, and then so people uh manage to like get around it by like in, introducing symmetry, and then when I see the title of of, of your uh, paper, I was just like, oh, okay, it seems that symmetry is also not that good. Yeah. Uh, okay, it's good. Oh. There's optimism at the end of the talk. Don't worry. It's all. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm looking forward for that and hope, hope okay, you kind yeah. of like be able to clear some of my, uh, yeah, my, my, my fate. Um, anyway, I, um, I think like so far we didn't have um, people asking questions. And I think like for this, like, uh, trainability is one should be uh, quite general. Uh, maybe like mm -hmm. uh, now they just need to need, need to have time to kind of think of questions. Then I think you can proceed on with the next uh, next part. Yeah, sure. Talk first. Yeah. If there's ever a question, just interrupt me because I won't notice probably. But yeah, yeah. feel free to interrupt me. Yeah, okay. I will. I will like I will moderate it. Yeah, when people like from questions in the chat, I will just like raise up to you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, right. So okay, this is why we're interested in these restricted classes of quantum neural networks one of which are the symmetric quantum neural networks. So let's talk about that. Um, so as far as I know, 
This paper from a year or so ago by Jens Eisert's group in Berlin was the first to consider this, really. Um, it might also have been people on Los Alamos, I forget, who first yep. started looking at these things. Um, but the, the idea is, OK, generically, these quantum neural networks are really horrible to train. But if it's uh, constrained by symmetries, then these assumptions for all these proofs won't hold anymore. Um, and so one thing you can do, for instance, is if you have a quantum machine learning model that's trying to learn some data, and you know ahead of time that that data satisfies some symmetries, like, I don't know, the classic example is you have uh, your symmetry group is the permutation, you know, the symmetric group, so the group of permutations, and your data is like on a graph or something. So it doesn't really matter what you label your vertices, um, like the the underlying uh, data point is the same. So you kind of bake in this uh, permutation invariance directly into your model. So that's one example um, that you might naturally want symmetries in a machine learning model. Um, but another nice thing, again, as I mentioned, is that it restricts the class of models and these untrainability results don't necessarily apply. So um, now I'm going to have <laughs> a very brief detour into representation theory. Um, very basic, though. Just to, to be more specific when I say uh, restricted by symmetries. So OK, going back to the example where we want a model that is uh, symmetric under permutation. What we really mean by that when it's a quantum model on qubits is that we have the symmetry group of permutations. And it has some representation. So if you're unfamiliar with this term, essentially, it's like uh, writing group elements as matrices that satisfy the same group product relations. So for the symmetry group, um, one representation of it are just swap operators on qubits. So you can write a permutation as a bunch of swaps um, and different permutations when they're written as swap operators product together like you would expect. So this is a representation of the symmetric group. Um, so that's one example, but you can, you know, in, uh, write a lot of symmetries as representations on n qubits. Um, but the important thing is, this isn't the only representation. Just because we picked these uh, swap operators as our representation for elements of the symmetric group, you can also have uh, much lower dimensional representations of various groups in general. and it turns out that when your group is finite, generally what you can do is block diagonalize these uh, representations of group elements into uh, things called irreps, so irreducible representations. So in other words, um, every representation uh, can be written in this block diagonal form where we have these different uh, these different irreducible representations that might be copied some number some number of times, but then we can we can write it like this. So I have a picture in the next slide that will hopefully make it more clear. Um, so just very quickly, one final definition. Um, I'm also going to mention every once in a while something called a faithful representation, and what I mean by this is uh, just a representation where every group element maps to a unique. Um, matrix. So in other words, like this uh, writing permutations as swap operators is unique because every permutation, uh, no two permutations are written as the same product of swap operators under this mapping. Um, but it turns out one nice thing about faithful representations is that every possible irreducible representation of some symmetry group appears in this block decomposition. So, OK, that was a lot. I'm just going to go to pictures now. Um, oh, OK. 
uh, in a couple slides, I'll go to pictures and then it'll hopefully be uh, easier to digest. But okay, considering now what the what the model looks like as a quantum circuit, all all that we really require is that we have some uh, machine learning model that's given by the parameterized evolution, you know, some parameterized unitary that you apply to some input state, and the input state might not satisfy the symmetries of your model. There's no requirement there. All that we require is that this uh, U of theta, just for technical reasons, we'll say these uh, generators HI of theta or HI, they commute with uh, your symmetry group representation and also whatever observable you're measuring uh, commutes. So this is called an equivariant quantum model when you have this sort of setup where your uh, evolution commutes with your symmetry group and also your observable. And the reason it's called equivariant is because when your input uh, transforms under the symmetry group, those symmetries commute through the U of theta. So it transforms equivariantly, but you don't really super need to know that. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna just focus on the symmetric group because I feel like being concrete here is probably the easiest way to explain these concepts. So let's just fix our symmetry group to be the permutation or the symmetric group, so the group of permutations. And it turns out that we can then write any of these HI or uh, O, so anything that's uh, that commutes with this uh, product of swap operators, we can just write it in a basis that's given by symmetrized poly operators. So in other words, um, HI and O, because they're Hermitian operators, have a poly decomposition. But we also know that they're invariant under permutations of qubits. And so not only do these operators have poly decompositions, but they have decompositions in terms of symmetrized poly operators. So in other words, we can write them in terms of these AJ, where these AJ are just a poly operator plus all of its permutations on qubits. Um, and then this is some normalization, so coefficients don't blow up. And we can we can write these observables and these generators as linear combinations of these symmetrized poly operators. Um, okay. Sorry, I have a question yeah. here. So some of uh, J1, Jx, Jy, and Jg is equal to n, right? So you yeah, just yeah. Like, so it's, I should mention that J is a partition event. So J1, Jx, okay. Jy, Jz, sum to n, um, mm -hmm. and then these R of pi are the swap operators, and we're just twirling by these swap operators, and then you can write a basis in terms of this. Right, you, from um, the poly basis, basically you generate the basis that's symmetric in the permutations, and then it yeah, will exactly. become your new basis. And then right. now you decompose the observables and the Hamiltonian in terms of this symmetric basis. Right, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is then what we mean by an equivariant quantum model is when you can write at least for G being the symmetric group, you can write it in terms of uh, decompositions of these symmetrized polys. Okay. Um, and you can do something similar for other group uh, symmetries. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Uh, we can do this. And I mentioned very briefly um, when I like mentioned representation theory, that one nice thing about representations is that you can block diagonalize them in terms of irreducible representations. So let's just examine as a specific example what I actually mean by that um, when we're talking about the, the algebra that's generated by these AJ. So, you know, these AJ, uh, you can sum together and then they also have some product rules. They're just poly operators. It's like, it's like the poly group, you know, but symmetrized. So let's look at what uh at what this block diagonalization looks like for for this system for this algebra so it's if you're familiar with uh singlet states and triplet states and those sorts of things it turns out this is actually what labels 
um, what what block the basis that block diagonalizes these operators simultaneously. So I'm going to use mapping notation uh, of lambda being labeling the irreducible representation, p lambda represent uh, labeling which of the which of its multiples we're, we're we're talking about, and then within an irreducible representation, labeling the basis by q lambda. So, you know, every every one of these uh, uh, matrix elements is labeled by lambda, p lambda, and q lambda. But going back to physics notation, if you're more familiar with that, and you're thinking about singlet and triplet states, um, what lambda really is is just the total spin of this basis state. Q lambda is just its uh, magnetization, so like it's uh, Z spin. And then P lambda is just its spin on subsystems. So really what these are, the basis that block diagonalizes these AJ are, are just generalizations of singlet and triplet states. Um, so you can even see when N is two qubits, this three by three matrix are all indexed by singlet states, sorry, triplet states. So triplet matrix elements are non-zero. And then this is the singlet state over here. But singlet triplet matrix elements, it turns out, are zero if the operator is symmetric under the permutation group, um, the symmetric group. So this is just generalizing all of that. And then this uh, thing that's light here is um, copies of an irreducible representation. So I wrote way back here that you could decompose this with some number of copies here, p lambda one, p lambda two, so on. So that's that's all this is. Um, these are some copies, but you know, there's you can have one representative, and these are all the same. So okay. Uh yeah, I actually have want to clarify that like for two or three slides uh, just now, like the one that you show yeah. the equation of multiple copies. So you have the index lambda one, lambda two, right? What is that about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I guess here I should have labeled this lambda i. I just, I dropped the subscript oh. i. So mm -hmm. lambda is labeling each of these terms. And then mm -hmm. p lambda is labeling one one of its copies. Mm -hmm. So uh, V lambda is, you know, this, these things, like mm -hmm. orange, blue, and green. P mm -hmm. lambda is which copy of it it is. Yep. And then Q lambda label within each of these copies. So okay. for this, Q lambda, you know, goes from one to four. It's really, okay. you know, spin magnetization. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. Right. But uh, you can explicitly write these things all out, it turns out. Um, so this is the example for n equals four. n equals two, it's singlet triplet states. And these are well studied and well known. So, okay, this is uh, maybe a little bit too into the weeds, but generally what you should be getting out of this is that these uh, AJ, so these symmetrized poly operators, you can simultaneously block diagonalize them in this basis, it turns out, um, where these uh, the number of these colors, so the number of lambda is order n, and the number of uh, like the size of each of these blocks is at most n by n. And there are going to be some high number of copies of maybe some of the blocks, but because uh, it turns out these elements are um, symmetric under the permutation group, these are all the same. So really, the number of independent parameters here scales as n to the third, uh, in short. So in other words, um, this is an n cube dimensional space uh, because there are n of these lambda, and then each of them is like an n by n matrix. So it's it, it grows something like n cubed rather than two to the n. Um, so oh yeah, okay. four to the n. So yeah, we have 
basically you are reduce that basically by exploiting a symmetry of your system, then you'll be able to reduce the dimensions from the exponential to the end to the polynomial yeah. to the end. Exactly. So um this isn't there's this has already been known for a while. And in fact, this is one of the motivations of these like uh symmetry equivariant quantum machine learning model papers, because they also notice this. Um, and intuitively, again, all those untrainability results were just due to the fact that this M, this degrees of freedom parameter, scaled exponentially with the system size. But now, um, when you have systems restricted by the symmetries, intuitively, this M can be polynomial in the system size. And so now these really bad things that scaled like two to the minus n now only scale as one over poly n. And so things are more trainable here. Um, but they actually prove stuff. You know, I'm just uh, giving hand wavy reasons, but they actually prove that in certain situations, this does lead to trainable QML models. So this paper by people over at Los Alamos, they looked at again, model symmetric under the symmetric group, so permutations. And they showed that indeed the degrees of freedom parameter for these models scales as n cubed. Um, so this is, you can actually, it's, you can get all the constant factors corrected everything. It turns out it's the tetrahedral numbers is what labels it, um, but they scale as n cubed. And then they looked at empirically um, what this decrease of freedom parameter is and saw it scaled as n cubed as well. So, yeah, and they also proved it. You know, they did numerics, but they also proved this. So, um, right. I know that was a lot. <laughs> uh, are there any questions? I guess what you should really get out of that section is uh, symmetry equivariant QNNs are nice because what these symmetries do is reduce the degrees of freedom of your system, and therefore all of these untrainability results that scale essentially how poor they are with the degrees of freedom, it's now not so bad because now things are poly n rather than exponential n. Are these degree of freedoms easy to control? As in like one, like now you exploit this kind of symmetries, like, but would you be able to kind of control this uh, degree of freedoms uh, easily in, for example, the experiment? Uh, yeah, so if you, so for instance, for the results of this paper to hold, you just need your HI and O and whatever BQE kind of algorithm you're considering. You just need HI and O to be able to be written as these symmetrized polys. Yeah, so and like once in, your models in, like this, then they prove that mm -hmm. your uh, degrees of freedom scales polynomially with system size. Okay, so so if you have a very complicated like symmetry, then uh, like basically the Hamiltonian will also be complicated if it's written in this symmetric uh, basis. Then um, basically the circuit that that then you need more gain in order to to kind of construct the ansatz. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, here it's proven for the symmetric group. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess what you're saying is for general groups, kind of what does this look like? General symmetry mm -hmm. groups. Um, so you can imagine, for instance, having uh, a very simple symmetry group like translational invariance. So mm -hmm. it's like a very, like you're only symmetric under um, shifts by up to n, you know, like by up to n qubits. It's a mm -hmm. much less structured and large group than the symmetric group. Mm -hmm. And there, what this kind of will look like, you can still write it as a direct sum of irreducible representations, but now they're going to be um, very large. <laughs> so um, the symmetric group is nice because you'll get, in, in this picture, lots of copies, like very high multiplicity. And all of these individual blocks are very small. Um, but generally, these blocks can be very large. And then you'll still have exponential scaling. So it's not true for all symmetry groups. Just right. certain symmetry groups 
but intuitively the ones that give you this nice block diagonalization in terms of small blocks, intuitively those are the same ones that are trainable because the trainability comes from the fact that you only have a few degrees of freedom comparatively. Right. Okay. So I'm not too sure I, um, my questions is kind of making sense. Um, is it possible to find a way to kind of isolate only the symmetric group that's like bigger in size, then we just ignore those it's small in size. Just ignore, like over here, I can see like there's uh, symmet like irreducible irreducible block that's bigger in size and smaller in size. We mm -hmm. uh, find a way to isolate just the one that's bigger in size because it will kind of like carry, carry more uh, kind of features for your data sets and we should only consider that. Uh, yeah, so you would have to like, so, so what these are, are things that are, uh, for instance, Essentially, generalizations of triplet states, they're mm -hmm. completely symmetrized and only labeled by their uh, how many spins up you have. So the Z magnetization. Okay. Um, uh -huh. So as long as your like space of operators can mm -hmm. be written in terms of this, then you're naturally kind of restricting to this space. Oh, um, okay, okay. Yeah, but I see. Yeah, so it's a bit. I, well, I'll get into this later. You kind of want a trade-off where you want your this this to be non-trivial enough that it just mm -hmm. doesn't automatically lead to a classical simulation. Um, okay. But you also want it to be nice enough that it's trainable on a quantum computer, and that's right. sort of the delicate balance here that um, okay makes it difficult. Yeah, maybe you so. can go to this the talk and maybe you answer my questions on that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that brings us to the paper. <laughs> uh, but the paper is very short, actually, and I think a very, well, in my biased opinion, a very nice short read. Um, it's essentially just taking this intuition and m making things formal. Um, so, right, intuitively, the same systems that have these very large symmetries and are therefore trainable because they have not so large degrees of freedom, um, are classically simulable is essentially the main thrust of our work. So what we show is that um, we give a classical algorithm for finding the ground state energy of symmetric Hamiltonians. Um, and we show that it's efficient if uh, this space doesn't have too many degrees of freedom. Um, we also are able to find the ground state itself but slightly worse uh, scaling here. And then finally, um, we give a simulation algorithm, a classical simulation algorithm for simulating the dynamics. So like actually simulating the uh, symmetric QML model. Um, but there are asterisks in all of these. So I'll, I'll get to the asterisks later, but um, right. And then, and then one thing, that we do do is we look at permutation invariant systems. And here we actually, we don't have any asterisks. Like we, we show directly how, how to do this for this group. Um, so, okay. Really, it's essentially what I already said. Um, I'm just gonna repeat it for emphasis. So we have the symmetry group and its representation acting on qubits. And then we can consider the space of things that commute with it. So uh, earlier, this was everything that was spanned by completely symmetrized poly operators. But generally, it has some other basis. And we assume you know that basis. Um, and uh, we have this representation acting on qubits. So really, this is like each, for instance, each completely symmetrized poly is really just like a two to the n by two to the n matrix, um, which is a very inefficient representation if x is low dimensional. So that's essentially the idea we're using is, you know, we have this very large inefficient representation to represent these objects, but there are more efficient representations to represent these objects by, for instance, getting rid of these unneeded copies here, these uh, extra 
things that, that are in the multiplicity. So just as an example of this, um, I can tell you the proof for the ground state uh, classical simulation algorithm in two lines. So assume that this dimension of the space that's symmetric under this group grows polynomially with the system size. So in other words, um, this if this is the space of completely symmetrized polys, what this is is like n cubed or something. Um, so this is just some abstract algebra object. And even though we're, you know, in principle considering this as operators acting on a two to the n dimensional space, there exists a low dimensional faithful representation of this algebra. Um, and in fact, when, when this dimension is uh, small enough, you can just efficiently find this efficient representation of it that's called the regular representation. And this is just some standard thing in representation theory. And all it does is it writes group elements. Uh, so these completely symmetrized polys, it considers them a mapping from them to vectors and some vector space that is of the same dimension. And then just writes down matrices that give the same uh, product rules effectively. So in other words, um, you have these structure constants. This is just what defines the algebra. You know, this is what defines how you multiply two elements in this, in this group. Um, and once you know all of these, you can write down this other representation efficiently. And because this representation is a faithful representation, I mentioned very briefly earlier, it can, when you write it in its block diagonal form, it has support in all of its irreducible representation uh, components. And because uh, you know the ground state energy has to exist in one of these things, um, you know that the ground state energy is also the ground state energy of this reduced representation. So when you find the ground state energy here, it's the same. So and this is a long way of saying you have an inefficient representation. You can efficiently calculate a more efficient one and then just find the ground state energy of that. And then it's the same. So um, that's the ground state energy like algorithm. It's very simple you know the structure constants. Um, and so that's maybe a bit of a warm up. But we can also talk about simulating these QML model dynamics. And there, um, something that's interesting is we don't need, just like the quantum model, we don't need that the initial state satisfies these symmetries. The initial state can be arbitrary. And all that we assume the existence of is this thing that we call a symmetry transform operator. So what this does is it takes um, the equivalent of your singlet and triplet states to uh, like labeled representations of them um, in the computational basis. So for instance, something that when it acts on a singlet state tells you it's the singlet state. And this actually is known to exist for the symmetric group. It's called the sure transform, but we consider more general symmetry groups so we just say that you need access to an operator that does this. Um, and if you do, and you know uh, your basis, so in the symmetric group case, the completely symmetrized polys, then we show that you can classically uh, evaluate these uh, Q and N loss functions. So it turns out you can calculate it in time that scales as the number of irreps times their dimension to the matrix multiplication constant. So think of this as like two point something. Um, and uh, this is acting on some initial quantum state. A classical computer doesn't have direct access to that quantum state. So we show that it's efficient if you're given an NPS description of it, or if you're given a classical shadow description of it. And we also show that this classical shadow description you can efficiently get from a quantum state. So um, yeah, this, this 
tells you that you can simulate these if you have a, a small number of irreps and they're all load dimensional. So the idea is actually pretty simple. I won't go through everything because I only have five minutes, but essentially you use this uh, symmetry transform operator to write this input state in a basis where uh, irreps and uh, multiplicities are labeled. And because you don't really care about this multiplicity, you can then just trace it out. So just throw out those qubits and then do classical shadows stuff using the remainder of your system. So it's, uh, you know, you transform, throw out some qubits and then you do classical shadows and then that's the algorithm essentially. So uh, we can look at this more closely for the symmetric group and uh, look at like a, a linear or not linear, uh, just a quantum classifier. Um, so this was looked at, this is the model that was looked at to show trainability in this uh, symmetry equivariant paper. And we show that when these input states are given as classical shadow or MPS descriptions, that you can evaluate this loss function actually in time uh, quicker than the quantum algorithm evaluates it because the depth of the circuits are n cubed, but we show how you can, uh, well, take these products um, in efficient time, assuming, yeah, some assumptions on how things are parallelized and stuff. So uh, this was interesting, but okay. Really the, the summary of this is that uh, if, Symmetries are good for making QNN models trainable, but you have to be careful and not apply too many symmetries because then um, they can be classically simulatable. But there are some asterisks to everything that I've just said. So for one, you really, if you actually want to um, write down ground states and stuff in terms of known basis elements, you have to know what your, uh, what the equivalent of your symmetrized polygroup, um, you have to know the equivalent of that, what their matrix elements are and whatever basis you're interested in. And that isn't necessarily a given. For the symmetric group, these things are very well studied. So we, we know these things um, and we calculate these things also in our, in our paper. Another thing you need is uh, the symmetry transform operator. Uh, you need it to be efficiently simulated, uh, efficiently run on a quantum computer. If you want to get a classical shadows description of your input quantum state that you can then classically simulate with. Um, and the groups that we're considering here that are classically simulatable are really over here where they're so big that your symmetries really constrict uh, any quantum advantage. So there's no real quantum advantage there. Um, but maybe smaller symmetry groups can hit a sweet spot between trainability and expressivity. And just as a quick side note, I'm actually giving a talk in a few weeks on this paper at the seminar. But um, we looked at other forms of restricted quantum neural networks. Here, ones that aren't symmetry equivariant, but use restricted types of quantum operations. And we actually prove a separation in, uh, in memory in performing certain tasks between this quantum model and classical models. So we have some, some numerics backing it up showing a quadratic separation between this quantum model and a transformer, for instance, on a given task. So that's, uh, that's it. Um, essentially the summary is two big symmetries that, uh, could, can make things simulatable. Um, that's essentially the intuition behind this. And I want to emphasize that not all hope is lost. There's still reason for optimism. Just you have to be careful balancing how restricted, uh, QNN architecture you want to look at is, and it's trainability. So thanks for having me. And are there any 
questions. Yeah, Eric, thanks for the insightful and interesting talk. Um, yeah, so before going to the questions, yeah, um, like Eric said, like he will be giving another talk um, on 29th of March. Um, yeah, and I will send out the emails uh, a few days before that. Uh, so far, we, uh, if you guys have any questions, you guys can just like, type it out in the chat and I could help you out. Or if you prefer to speak it up, just raise your hand. Uh, yeah, so yeah, in, in, yeah, so, so, um, well, this seems to be the bad news for like quantum neural network, but from a machine learning perspective, uh, it is a good news, right? Because like we, uh, we have been like trying to study the property of quantum systems uh, using machine learning algorithms. And now it seems like you, you'll be able to like, uh, be able to use your tool of analysis to find a way to extract information and trying to uh, get uh, the reduced representations of it and then fit into a machine algorithm to learn the properties, right? Yeah, because like I know yeah. like robot has already like uh, used uh, classical shadows to extract um, the uh, like to to uh, to learn, for example, the ground state uh, for energies of some Hamiltonians. Yeah, so now you kind of provide a much simpler way, or maybe uh, uh, yeah, maybe it could be a much simpler way. I'm not too sure. Um, to for a machine learning algorithm to learn about the quantum system. Yeah, so here it doesn't really say anything about the learnability of these things. It just says that if a quantum architecture can do it, then you can just classically simulate the quantum architecture that does it. And then a classical architecture can also do it. Um, so really it's like if a quantum, if you have some training algorithm that you know works on a quantum model, and that quantum mm -hmm. model satisfies all the assumptions of our proofs, then okay. you can write down a classical algorithm that mm -hmm. also learns the thing um, just by simulating the quantum model that you already know learns the thing. Uh, so it's really like a, yeah, it, it is good news generally if you're on the classical side of things and you want to mm -hmm. simulate these symmetric quantum systems because this just tells you how to do it or how to do it generally. And if you're interested in groups that we don't consider here um, in our paper specifically, like what group theoretic things you need from that group to be able to simulate it um, or simulate systems symmetric under it. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, uh, it's really more a simulation thing. It's like okay, simulation thing. Yeah, yeah, just think of tweaking it into because like if you uh, you are, you can simulate the system, then you can already make all the prediction that you do have to use the machine learning to do the prediction. Yeah, uh, I mean, you could still like another way of putting this. And I think this is what you're getting at is, um. There are now classical machine learning algorithms for doing certain things that there previously existed quantum machine learning algorithms for. Um, mm, okay. Yeah. But um, whether or not the classical machine learning algorithm works depends on if the quantum machine learning algorithm works. Like, uh, we don't ever um, really uh, okay, I see. the machine learning I aspects of it. Yeah. I see. I see. We, we just see. look at the simulation side. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think that there's much work to do in order to probe like what is a switch spot because. Yeah, definitely. And we know that, uh, okay, maybe not under symmetry equivariance, but we mm -hmm. know that there exist restricted architectures that are in this sweet spot, but it's not understood well at all. <laughs> so uh, more work there definitely has to be done. OK, that's cool. That's cool. OK, seems like currently there's no much from the audience. Um, yeah, I guess um, they might need some time to digest the information because. Like, yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, the, like the, it's quite 
kind of like actually it did a great job in summarizing what is the uh uh equivalent theory like group theory and all those stuff and I kind of like be able to learn more deeply on from it. Um yeah so I think this now is like 605. If they have question they might reach out to you by email or yeah, something. Just email me. Uh yeah and I think we can uh, now stop the uh seminars and looking forward to have you uh again in the yeah, next few weeks to, for the first seminar. Yeah. yeah. Thanks again for right, uh, thanks. agreeing to talk in our talks. Yeah, See no you. problem. See you all.